Okay, great. Can you uh, introduce him to us and then and have him start? That would be fantastic. We're ready for you. Over to you. Okay. So, first of all, I would like to thank for the invitation and say that it's a new and exciting experience for me. Um, I will read my text. We don't have time to lose. And my images, my presentation will be in loop at the same time. Can so, I interrupt you? <clears throat> Can I interrupt you for a moment? While on one hand, our era was inaugurated with the fall of the Berlin Wall. On the other hand, new walls continue to be built. I'm referring to the so-called walls of shame that separate areas of military and diplomatic conflict, like those between San Diego and Tijuana, or between Israel and Cisjordan, or those that protect the enclosed luxury middle class gated community in the suburbs of large cities. Thus, while this is an era free of the great ideological conflict that defined watertight territories, it is also an era of increasing but less explicit internal divisions, mirroring the growth of the ethnic and religious conflicts and the global escalation of social exclusion. Published in 1990, the book City of Quartz by Mike Davis takes the city of Los Angeles as a locus of the explosive contemporary urban situation. A city without roots, originally formed by immigrants from west and from the east, Los Angeles became the symbol of a diffuse urbanity, dominated by cars and highways, shopping malls, low-density suburban gated communities, and an almost complete absence of public spaces. In other words, the city appears as the archetypical place of passive subord subordinations of the industrialized intelligentsia to the program of the capital, in Davis' words. Although it is also a fertile ground for the emergence of some of, some of the harshest criticism of the culture of recent capitalism, literature and cinema noir. In short, for Davis, Los Angeles performs the double role of utopia and dystopia for advanced capitalism. Given its turbulent and unique history, Los Angeles is a kind of anticipated decantation chamber of the worldwide conflicts within the United States. Marked by violent racial and social conflicts, the city has become the stage of an unspoken urban Cold War, brutally opposing the fortified cells of affluent society and the places of terror where the police struggle against the criminalized poor, the ghettos. As Davis shows, the growing paranoia of urban security has fed there a programmed destruction of its public spaces, <clears throat> leading to a simultaneous increase in private security services with the privatization of streets, public spaces, and beaches. This caused to the city to gradually turn into a spaced out of fortresses, separated by an urban mass that, that extends infinitely throughout the territory, consuming it. Paradoxically, the city that is affirmed as the dream of individual mobility is today living the nightmare of collective imprisonment. <clears throat> the question of contemporary urban dispersion with the correlated creation of homogeneous and banal landscapes as if cloned 
and replicated from one place to another in an indifferent and arbitrary way have become an increasingly popular theme of research in the areas of urbanism and urban sociology. And behind the question lies the notion of global city, which is seen in a context of the worldwide rise of the cities faced with the globalization of the economy, the excessive enlargement of companies, and the decline of nation states. This means that in the current situation, the city are becoming monadic from an economic, cultural, ideological, and sometimes even political point of view. In other words, they are turning into practically autonomous units, disconnected from the national context that gave rise to them. This places them, obviously, at the heart of the contemporary problem filtering all the previous history based on a new perspective. The global cities are emerging as centers of business, services, and tourism in the context of a post-industrial globalized economy that is dominated by financial capital. Thus, they are affirmed as host bases, places for transnational capital that is for the big companies that desire to live in a continuous, uniform territory throughout the world, which can provide them with maximum liquidity and mobility in space. These cities, therefore, tend to minimize their traditional peculiarities of historical formations, their national identities, tending toward a progressive, morphological generalization. As an extreme example, a city like Tokyo will have, or already has, much more affinity with New York or London than with any other Japanese city. But affinity, in this case, doesn't necessarily mean cooperation. The global cities are becoming more homogenized in order to better balance out their minor differences and thereby compete more efficiently in the struggle to win capital in the global economy. We are living in a time when all the Marxist idea of a reserve army of labor, union awareness, and forms of labor resistance are losing strength, as Mike Davis shows in Planet of Slums. His analysis composes a portrait of the situation of the third world as a kind of trash of the global process of late capitalism. In other words, it is a generalized expansion of slums linked to informal labor and the proliferation of the evangelical church and Islamic fundamentalism. These phenomena are all interconnected, <clears throat> as in a certain way, the whole planet has become a stage of the process of dualization that Davis had seen and analyzed before in Los Angeles, the fortified enclaves connected to a transnational network, and the proliferation of slums and ghettos abandoned by the global economic progress. Davis recalls, for example, that the transition from the 70s to the 80s, with the entry of the IMF on the scene, there was an accelerated urbanization worldwide, a time when industry stopped growing. It was really in this period that the great megalopolis of the third world saw a demographic explosion that was not accompanied by an equivalent industrialization. This occurred because people migrated to the cities, no longer prompted by the real offer of jobs, but because they were expelled from the rural areas by hunger, drought, and the impacts of agribusiness. It was a destructive phenomenon. 
not only in Brazil, but also in Africa and Asia, generating enormous cities lacking in infrastructure, as in the case of Lagos in Nigeria. McDavid's analysis shows that the slums are endemic, that they were generated by the system, and that they reveal a new dynamic of structural disintegration of late capitalism, which canceled out all the previous projects for national development. Therefore, there are no longer autonomous or organized communities struggling for their rights. Instead, there is a religious fanaticism replacing any embryo of conscience of class or materialist vision of the historical process. In the classical work, The City in History, Louis Mumford dedicates almost a thousand pages to, to tracing a historical course from the Neolithic settlements to the English and North American garden cities conceived by Ebenezer Howard. Behind the violent condemnation of the chaotic, disorganized city of the 20th century, an idealization resonates of the village communalism that gave ammunition for all the commun community fever of the 70s. For us here in Sao Paulo, distant neighborhoods like Alphaville or Granja Viana, for example, are in a certain way hairs of this nostalgia for the life in the countryside. Together with a vector of urban expansion that became consolidated with the rise of the automobile. Whether in the wake of the Garden Cities or in the wake of Los Angeles, these models represent an escape from the city. In the 80s, the world saw a return to an urban optimism in which the great trend among architects, urban planners, and thinkers was the revival of the public space. Under the impetus of a small-scale participative urbanism, an art done on the streets, and the affirmation of the multi-ethnic and multicultural cultural communities, a culturalism of citizenship was reborn based on enjoyment of the urban environment and the retaking of urban space by both civil society and the market to the detriment of the state. It is in this context that the urban art of the site-specific type made a criticism of the physical notion of site and came closer to the real communities, approximating the artist as Hal Foster says, to the ethnographer. The great economy transformations of the 90s, the destruction of the social welfare state, the economic and cultural globalization, the diffusion of the internet, the prevalence of the financial speculation, and above all, the growing social apartheid, quickly caused the good intentions of that historical period to become buried. Faced with the new scale of urban operations that emerged to support the global competition between global cities, or a unified Europe ready to renew itself in a spirit of city marketing or architectural spe spectacularization, another ideological context is imposed demonstrating that the new centrality of the culture in the urban economy is accompanied by a process of growing social dilaceration in which the fantasy of the neutral public space was no longer more than an act of bravado. In this context, a new situationism is highlighted today in which the architects abandon the reconciled idea of public space in the name of the drift, that is, from the understanding of the city as a chaotic multiplicity of non-converging flows, but at the same time transforming what was previously a subversive practice into a ludic pragmatis pragmatism. Quanto tempo? 
it should be said that after the 80s, well-intentioned gamble on the restorative nature of the public space became an obsession among architects, which has covered up a lack of critical thinking on the changing reality of the world in recent decades. <clears throat> In recent decades, the experience of the city has been tremendously dilacerated. In the industrial model, the circulation was convergent and aggregating, like the cities forming around the ports, the factories, or the coal mines, and around train terminals. Today, the post-industrial city is dispersive and diver divergent. It is mercurial, like the goods themselves. Today, the large concentrations of services, for example, are no longer to be found in the idealized public spaces, but in the hubs of mass circulation, like the intermodal transport terminals or the parts of the city where pedestrians circulate on foot to make transport connections overrun by crowds of street hawkers and stalls or perhaps in the new airport complexes, which are gigantic cities of transnational services, indifferently plonked in various places around the world. With the acceleration of communication and transport, today vast numbers of people are permanently in transit, whether for work, tourism, or business purposes. This has, has meant that new destinations for large-scale travel can be invented almost from one day to the next, as in the iconic case of Dubai, for example. Today, an enormous part of the population in a city like Sao Paulo spends much of their lives inside buses, trains, subways, and cars. So these are the new public spaces in a certain way. Thus, I think that to improve and develop this mass public transportation system is an, action, is an action which today is more effective than creating parks and plazas. I mean, <clears throat> the new parks and plazas in a city like Sao Paulo should be the urban equipments connected to the main system of circulation in the metropolis and not conceived as spaces to escape from it, like in an idealized and fake European city. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that was great. That was a very interesting overview. And, uh, we would like to go straight into questions. So uh, there's no one here from Manchester at the microphone right now for questions, but maybe there are some in Sao Paulo. So over to you, Sao Paulo. Do you have any questions after that wonderful talk? So, Guilherme, I have a question for you. And I'm going to do it in English. And if you have any doubts, I can kind of double check it in Portuguese. And I was hoping if you could maybe expand a little bit your ideas and try to connect it with the impact of technology on nowadays cities. So, for example, when you talk about new kinds of situationisms and this kind of things, um, how do you see that this is happening from the perspective of these um, increasing number of devices that I have, for example, mobile phones, GPS, and this kind of things. What do you think they are doing to these situations that you call a new situation? Is okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's an interesting question. I remember in the '90s when I started to study uh, architecture. Uh, uh, I remember the books, uh, th there were uh, uh, such um, catastrophic theory that the new technologies would replace urban spaces. For example, uh, with the system of delivery uh, and internet, uh, buying everything by internet and meeting 
people by internet, etc., the urban space would uh, in the future disappear or would lose uh, importance. And in the 90s, I think it, it was very hard to, to understand what would be this kind of transformation. And now it's clear for me that it, it, it wasn't happened. Uh, it's, it was not true, in fact. So uh, the new technologies has transformed uh, a lot uh, sociability and relations, but wasn't replaced urban space. It is important to, 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 to see. Um, I like, for example, a book. I don't remember the name of the author. It's Heinhold, uh, something about it. But the book, uh, the name is Smart Mobs. The first chapter, he describes a situation in Tokyo, uh, which is named, the name, the name of the chapter is Shibuya Epiphany. It's interesting because Shibuya Crossing is the main crossing of pedestrians and, and it, it's the Times Square of Tokyo uh, <coughs> with lights and etc. And he describes a situation in Tokyo where the new young generation uh, makes meeting in the urban spaces with mobile, uh, with message, text message, with a cloud of text messages by mobile phone. It's in interesting because they, so they are not uh, escaping from the cities or, or from the urban space, but in the other, on the contrary, they are uh, reoccupating the urban space by using another technology. Because uh, we have a question in Istanbul, I believe. So we're going to go over to, is that right? Rachel, can you uh, let me know? Is there a question in Istanbul? Yes. OK, great. So over to you, Istanbul. Thanks very much, Manchester. Um, wow, I mean, that really struck a chord with people here. That was fantastic. Um, uh, I think we've got quite a few questions here. Um, I'm not quite sure how much time we have, but um, I know that uh, Nilofar wants to ask something. Just before that, I'm just going to remind the audience here that if you want to ask a question, we're on now, so if you can stand up by the front, if you have one, then we can get a microphone to you, because I don't reach the back. Thanks, guys. Um, so Nilofar, over to you with your question. Uh, it's kind of like the, the, in the same line of thinking what the previous question was, but uh, after hearing uh, your thought a bit more about it, how do you foresee uh, a, a new uh, urban space, let's say, because I understand that it's a uh, replacing uh, that you are talking about, uh, the, the information technologies and networking potentials as a way to, uh, to um, bind together the cliff or let's say the chiasm that is uh, apparently there we see, because it is also part of the capitalist uh, tool uh, and the way it communicates and uh, uh, readapts itself. You can go. So. Mas eu tenho que responder essa primeiro? Yeah, sim. So, uh, sorry for the delay in understanding your question. Um, I, I don't know if, if there will be a new public space or a new kind of space. Uh, we are seeing a transformation of relations more than spaces, I think. So, uh, but, but yeah, it's a capitalist, in a capitalist tool, now everything is capitalist. So uh, it's hard to, to imagine something uh, different from, from it. Um, but, but I mean, in Sao Paulo, that I was trying to describe more precisely, uh, I think public spaces are, are being replaced by circulation system or infrastructure thinking. Uh, we see here many, many squares or plazas 
closed by barriers, uh, not used by population. So uh, in a kind, uh, I think uh, it's more it idealized an idea of, of living in, a, in like an European city that is not an European city anymore. It's a new kind of city dominated by the automobile and uh, closed spaces or spaces uh, indoors. <laughs> Uh, to that point, uh, from, uh, from I think we're done here with questions for now. Uh, so it's over to you. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I just heard you say that we're all capitalists now and we can't imagine any way out of this sort of empire, this condition of empire that neoliberalism leaves us with. And I actually don't agree with that at all. As a matter of fact, um, we've been given some very fertile and powerful metaphors from uh, information technology itself. And I'm, I'm very surprised in this discussion not to hear any mention of, of open source and free software and the metaphors for, for organization that they give us. I'm very surprised not to hear any mention of uh, non-rivalrous exchanges of, of value um, that, uh, you know, when, when uh, information networks transform the production of knowledge, what we see is the scarcity economy getting slowly replaced by a non-scarcity economy of non-rivalrous, freely shared goods. And I would challenge you that any conversation of public space or of architecture or, or of, of the polity in this day and age that doesn't incorporate that perspective, um, it's certainly therefore lacking something uh, from the strategic toolkit and, and I, would, I would regard it as, as perhaps dangerously incomplete. So I, I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. I, I, I would like to, to comment on this also because uh, I think uh, some of the subjects you're mentioning uh, uh, we're, gonna, they are going to be spot or they are going to be mentioned and commented by uh, our um, other guests or presenters, uh, especially in, uh, with Cicero Diaz walking through. So he's going to mention uh, an open, open source uh, experience, a project called, called Walking Tools. And Giselle Begeman is also closing the sessions today by mentioning uh, some of this experience. But there, uh, I would like also to mention that there is a lot of, of um, uh, it's tempting to keep talking about open source uh, software or open source culture in Brazil, especially in regards of the, the successful uh, ex successfully experienced uh, done by the uh, Minister of Culture in Brazil by using um, Linux, by uh, re refusing to use a proprietary software and choosing Linux. But uh, to talk about openness, to talk about free culture, to, to talk about uh, um, open source information and open, open access is uh, a lot wider than just focusing on open data or, or a, a technologically uh, based uh, discussion. And of course, in, in our festival, have been pointing to the situations in, by, uh, in our conference and also in projects we have been presenting. But I guess today, in, uh, in, our, the, in the next uh, hours, we're going to focus this also. And also, we know that Philippe Fonseca is talking from Manchester to our audience here, and, and he's probably uh, will put the finger on this, on this point also. Sorry. Great. So I don't know if uh, Guilherme has something else no. to add. So on that note, uh, it's now time for our break. So we're going to take a, a short break. And if everyone could be back in 15 minutes, that would be fantastic. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll reconvene in 15 minutes. And we'll, when we come back, uh, we will have the uh, quick fire presentations from you, Sao Paulo. OK, see you in 15 minutes.